this morning, and I hope you do, turn to Psalm 49. Next week, Psalm 50 will be the final psalm we will cover this summer, and then I'm looking forward to doing a series um, from the chapter 2 and 3 of the book of the Revelation on the seven churches of Asia Minor. I'm looking forward to that. There's some great lessons for every church in those passages. So, Psalm 49, we'll begin reading in verse 1. It says, Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Why should I fear in times of trouble? When the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches, truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice, that he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations. Though they called lands by their own names, man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet after them, people approve of their boasts. Selah. Like sheep, they are pointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their forms shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me, Selah. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his houses increase. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives... He counts himself blessed, and though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers, who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beast that perish. This is God's word. When I was a child, I often watched a show that I'm sure many of you watched I often watch the show show Sesame Street. How many of you watched that when you were a child? I used to watch that show when I was a kid. You know, of course, it was this educational show involving Muppets. That was the real reason I watched it. I'm confessing to you now, I've always been a Muppet fanatic. I love the Muppets. I know you think you're such a nerd, but I don't care. I love the Muppets. And and there were a lot of different segments to the show and that were fun and interesting. But the one that always stuck in my mind more than any other was this segment that always started with this annoying little song They went like this. One of these things is not like the other. How many of you remember that? Now that song is going to be in your brain the rest of the day. Right? A mighty fortress is our God. That's right. That's the song you sing when another song gets stuck in your brain. Right? So, and then of course they'd show these four items which one was different from the other three and they would have to identify them that it wasn't the same. And I used to think when I was a kid, man, I am smart. I can always identify the one that's different. Now, I challenge you, go back and watch some, Google that and watch some YouTube videos. They are the simplest, most, I was not smart. I could tell that a balloon this big wasn't the same as a balloon this big. (laughs) Big deal, right? But we remember that. Well, I say that because Psalm 49 is very, very different from most of the other psalms that we have studied. It is the last song, uh, psalm in what's called the Songs of Korah, which are Psalm 42 through 49. But it's even very different from those particular psalms. You see, it's not a psalm of prayer. It's not a psalm of praise. It's not a psalm of worship. It's not a psalm of lament. It's not even like the last one we studied last week, which was a song of Zion. Uh, there's a lot of verses, in fact, you mentioned the mighty fortress is our God that comes from Psalm 46. So a lot of psalms have verses that we can kind of sing back to God. Like Psalm 46, 1, God, you are a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. They speak of the attributes and the character of God, and they give us these incredible words and phrases that we can then say back to God. But this psalm 
really is different. It, fi- it, it actually is more like what we call wisdom literature. It is a wisdom psalm. It, it reads a lot like the book of Proverbs or the book of Ecclesiastes. It gives instruction. It gives direction. It talks of wisdom and understanding. And there are words that we constantly read over and over in the book of Proverbs. But in Psalm 49, it's also a little different because the writer is really thinking about some things. And he sets to music his reflections, the things he's thinking about. And what he's thinking about is the problem of prosperity for the wicked, the, pro- the, the age-old, what he calls the riddle of death. In other words, he is going to use a song to teach us something. He says in verse 4, I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Well, you know, we have no idea what this psalm would have sounded like when they sang it. We know that they did. And, and, but we do know that using songs is a very effective teaching tool. In fact, it has been for many, many years, all throughout secular history as well as church history, and it's still encouraged today. I googled songs as teaching tools, and there were all kinds of things that came up where you could use songs to teach. Well, and, 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 and even in traditional school settings, for years, I've watched Janine do this very thing. Janine has songs for everything. I mean, she's got songs on pronouns, prepositions, adjectives, linking verbs. She even, last night I asked her about those songs. You know what she started singing? Conjunction, junction, what you... You remember that song? Schoolhouse It's always Schoolhouse Rock in Janine's classroom. But, but don't think she just uses it for little kids. You see, when, when we were living in Florida, one year she stepped in to teach senior English with a bunch of the most knuckle-headed, hard-headed kids you've ever met. I love them dearly because they're just like me. But these stu- some of these students in this class really, really struggled academically. And so Janine taught these 17- and 8-year-old kids these same songs that she used for elementary school. And you know what? They learned English for the first time in their lives. And they passed the class. So in the opening lyrics of this song, here's what we can see. The first thing we see is he gives a call to be wise and to hear. One of the tools that we use in interpreting the Bible is looking at who the original author intended to write to, who the author had in mind. If you read the Bible, certain passages are written to Israel, certain passages are written to the church, certain passages are written to everyone. And that's the case in this psalm. Verse 1 talks about all people, all inhabitants of the world. It talks about both low and high, rich and poor. The writer is going to teach us something in this song that applies to every person, in every situation, in every circumstance, in every location. And he's asking them to hear and give ear to what he's going to sing about. So I want to look at two words that are important in those verses. The first one is the word hear in verse 1. Now, most of us have heard that word here before. It comes from a word, Shema, in Hebrew, which has the idea of more than just letting noise pass through your auditory nerves as background. In fact, the word Shema really means this. It's the idea of sit up and pay attention. Or, as many of my teachers used to say to us in class, they'll say, listen up, this is going to be on the test. And I remember as a kid, I didn't pay attention a lot, but when they said that, I did pay attention because I figured I'd get at least one or two of them right, correct? In fact, this is the same word Shema that is used in Deuteronomy 6.4, which is called the Great Shema. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This was the most basic confession of faith in, for, for the Jews. I mean, it was faith in their God and who he was. It spoke clearly to them in the midst of a culture that worshipped many, many gods. They had this short saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is once. Because it was critical that they knew who God was. And and that call to listen up, to pay attention, to hear God is found throughout the Bible. Even in the last book of the Bible, Jesus tells the church at Thyatira, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And, And the primary way that we, as the church, hear God's voice is through His Word, the Bible. And just like Israel of old that lived in a pluralistic society, we too live in a pluralistic society with so many voices competing for our attention that it is staggering and mind-numbing sometimes. And so it is critical that we listen to God, that we hear His voice in His Word if we are going to know who God truly is. Our culture will tell us many things about God. 
But only the Bible will tell us the truth about who God really is and the way he really acts in our world. The first word is here. Pay attention. Listen up. The second word is the word wisdom in verse 3. It comes from a word that means skill. And that could be applied to a lot of different things. I mean, in fact, we were, we were watching a show in my house called Forged in Fire. It's this really neat show where these bladesmiths compete to make a working knife in about six hours. They take a little thing of steel or, or a part from some, some other tool and they have to forge this working knife. And occasionally what will happen is an older man will come and join, be one of the contestants. Guy, I mean, I've seen guys that are in their 70s that join this show and they're forging knives. And what's amazing is the judges are always impressed with the older guy. You know why? Because he doesn't waste any energy or any time in the way that he makes that knife. He has learned wisdom when it comes to making knives. But when we talk about biblical wisdom, there's, it's much deeper than that. You see, it's not just skill at a profession or activity. It's not just being good at something. Biblical wisdom is skill for living in a way that pleases God. And God places a great importance on wisdom. He says in Proverbs 16, How much better to get wisdom than gold? To get understanding it is to be chosen rather than silver. Again, Proverbs 2 6 says, The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. The idea is that we are to look at our world and our experiences through the lens of God's word, the scripture, and live by his wisdom. And this is so important for us. And this is why we need to, every one of us, be students of the Word of God. And it's not to gain knowledge so you can win an argument. It's not to prove your point. The reason we learn the Scripture is to know God, to hear God's voice, to gain His wisdom so that we can live a life that pleases Him and glorifies Him in our world. And so this lyric say, hey, listen up, pay attention, this is important. The next section of lyrics deal with the common experience of death in verses 5 through 12. In fact, it begins with this question, okay, why should I fear? goes on to say, why should I fear those who trust in wealth? And, and understand what he's saying here. It's not saying that he's afraid of rich people. Really what it's saying, he's kind of questioning, he's thinking about it. Why am I so anxious? Why does it bother me so much that people put their trust in wealth? Why does it bother me so much that people trust the riches? I mean, for us today, that may seem like an odd question. We go, well, who in the world would trust with riches? But the historical context makes sense because in the Jewish culture, they looked at wealth in two ways. They looked at it, first of all, as a gift from God, which it is. Many Bible verses teach us that, that wisdom comes from God, excuse me, wealth comes from God. But they took it further than that. They also looked at wealth as a stamp of approval on their lifestyle so even if they were dishonest and crooked and wicked if they were rich they thought well God's pleased with me and that is absolutely not true that is heresy the idea that God is pleased with you because you have a lot of money is the prosperity gospel it is false it is untrue and honestly it is deceiving millions of people in our world now we don't know if the author of this psalm was wealthy or poor we have no idea but what we do know is that he understood some things. See, he understood that no one can purchase eternal life. He says, truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on and never see the pit. The word life there is a Hebrew word that has a, speaks of the human soul. It's more than just being alive. He's talking more than just being about the, the pit talks about more than just going to the grave. It's talking about the ultimate empty destiny of those who don't know God. So the psalmist is talking about eternal life here, not just physical life. And the redemption of a soul can only be accomplished by the sacrifice that God made through Christ. You see, and we see this sacrifice throughout the entire Bible. We see the Bible talking about from the beginning, the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sinned and what happened? God clothed Adam and Eve with coats of skins. In other words, he made a sacrifice on their behalf. We know that it was practiced among Abraham's time, Genesis 22. We know that God provided a ram to sacrifice in the place of Isaac. In, in the sacrificial system of the Jews, in the law, especially the offering of the spotless lamb for the sin offering. 
And then when we get to the New Testament, we see this idea of sacrifice beautifully fulfilled and perfected by Jesus Christ at the cross. You see, it's what provides redemption for our souls. It's not our wealth, and it's not any kind of religious activity that we may get involved in. I mean, this is what Titus says. It says that God saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Charles Spurgeon said it so well. He said this, he said, Riches cannot buy talent. They cannot buy the excellency of mind or heart. They cannot give a good physical constitution. They cannot prolong life. I think this is so true. They tend to increase rather than diminish our fears. They cannot soothe a guilty conscience. They cannot cool a fever. They cannot fix a headache or a heartache. And they can contribute nothing to salvation. And so this psalmist is reminding himself that when, although when he looks around it seems like all of God's enemies are rolling in money, he understands that in the end, it is not worth trusting in riches because that is powerless against the greatest realities of life, both physically and eternally. And he knew that. But he knew, secondly, that no one can escape death. See, he reminds that, he uses these words. He says, the wise dies, the, the fool dies, the stupid die, the arrogant die. What he's saying is that death comes to everyone. In baseball terms, death, its batting average is 1,000. It never strikes out. It never misses. In fact, the Bible tells us in Hebrews that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this comes the judgment. And, and if you get one thing today, get this. The greatest reality of this life is the fact that this life will come to an end and we will face God, our Creator. See, the wealthy in this psalm, they thought, I'm rich, somehow I can escape it. But the truth is, no one has ever escaped death and no one ever can. And so with all those truths in mind, we come to this last section of lyrics and he gives us a contrast of two paths. In other words, two sides of the coin. See, he's, doing, he's using a proverb. If you read the book of Proverbs, you see that the writer often uses what's called parallelism. In other words, he shows you the two sides of one coin. He says, if you do this, this is what happens. If you do this, this is what happens. He, and that's what he's using here. He's showing us two specific paths that we can choose in life with two specific results. The first path and the first result is this. Simply, those who trust in riches will be rejected. He writes, be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. Paul kind of captures the same idea in 1 Timothy when he says, we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of the world. And, and I mean, when you read words like that, is it any wonder that the psalmist is trying to convince us that we are not to trust in our riches because they don't last? And it's hard to read this psalm without thinking of Jesus' parable, the rich fool in Luke 12. Do you remember that parable? Jesus tells this story, and many commentators think that when he told that story, he was thinking of this specific psalm because they match so perfectly. Uh, think about it. In the story, we learn of this wealthy farmer whose land produced such a great crop that he has nowhere to put his crops. He's out of space. And so he says, what shall I do? Since I have no place to store my crops. Then he says, this is what I do. I will tear down my barns, build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my, my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? And then Jesus gives the application. He says, so is the person who stores up treasure for themselves and is not rich toward God. And Jesus is reminding us of the same truth, that trusting in riches, or let's be honest, trusting in anything else except for God himself. Now listen to me. Trusting in your religion, 
trusting in your baptism, trusting in your church membership, trusting in your knowledge, trusting in anything else except God himself is actually rejecting God's gracious gift in Jesus Christ and it can never earn us anything before God. But here's the second path and the second result and that is this, that those who trust in God will be received. See, up to this point, the psalmist kind of concentrated on exclusively on the foolishness of those who trust in riches. And it goes without saying, but he's not saying it's wrong to have money. I mean, I don't know about you, but I like to have a couple dollars in my pocket. But I have two boys that are all, they take all my money, so I very rarely have money in my pocket. But I do like it. He's not saying it's wrong to have money. He's saying it's wrong to trust in your wealth and riches or anything else besides God. So, Listen to what he says. He gives this confident confession in verse 15. And it starts with these two incredible words. He tells all this misery about those who trust in riches. And then he says, but God. Now you see that a lot in the New Testament. That, that phrase, but God. But here's one in the Old Testament. And this is what he says. He says, although those who trust in the riches will be rejected, he says, but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, and he will receive me. A lot of people think that the Old Testament doesn't have a, a clear doctrine of eternal life after death. They kind of think the Old Testament saints didn't know anything, but that's not really true. This is one verse among many, actually, that kind of refute that idea. He says that God would receive him. That word receive is the same word that's used in Genesis 5 when it talks about Enoch, who would be received up into heaven. He would be taken by God into heaven. It's also used in Psalm 73 where it says, You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me up to glory. I can think of other things. Think about David when his little child died. He said, I'll not see him again on this world, but I will see him again. Think about Job who says, I know my Redeemer li lives, but I will see him in the later day. Think about Daniel who talked about those who, who live in righteousness who will shine like the stars throughout eternity. I mean, over and over and over, it is obvious that these people in the Old Testament had a hope of life with God beyond the grave. Now that hope became much clearer in the New Testament because Jesus came. He explained things clearly and plainly, but it is here in the Old Testament as well. And so the psalmist, his hope that he has comes from the fact that he knew God would ransom him. He knew God would redeem him. That word redeem has the idea of someone being, something being bought out of the marketplace. In other words, it refers spiritually to God buying us out of the marketplace of sin and setting us free. And when we get to the New Testament, we know that Jesus Christ paid the price that our sin deserved. You see, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. Separation from God eternally. But Jesus died to pay the price so that we can go free by faith in him. And so if you're here today and you've trusted Jesus alone, you have a hope beyond the grave. You have a hope that God will receive you and welcome you into heaven. And remember, a biblical hope isn't just, I think so. A biblical hope is a 100% concrete fact that we understand. But if you've trusted in your riches or anything else, then the truth is, ultimately, there is no hope beyond this life. In fact, Murdoch Campbell said this, and I think, what a powerful, powerful phrase. He said this, we leave the world either with God or with nothing. Let me say that again. We leave the world either with God or with nothing. Many years ago, there was a young man named Jonathan Edwards. If you know anything about church history, you probably read about him. God used him in many unique ways to touch off the, uh, the great awakening in the American colonies, but... He wrote down 70 resolutions to govern his life. And he wrote them down when he was very young. He was actually 19 years old when he wrote these things. And this is number nine of his resolutions. He says, resolve to think much on all occasions of my dying and the common circumstances which attend death. Now that may strike us as strange. Why on earth? It, I mean, doesn't our culture teach us, don't think about death, just live it up right now. YOLO, you only live once, have fun, right? He says, no, I'm going to think about it. And we might think that's morbid, especially for a 19-year-old. But here's what he was doing. He was really just applying the message of Psalm 49. Because none of us can escape death. 
because we cannot purchase eternal life. Wisdom teaches us that our trust should not be in anything else except for God himself, the only one who can redeem our souls and receive us to himself. So the application this morning is simple. There's a lot of voices in our world calling for our attention every day. What voice are you listening to? And even more importantly, whom are you trusting? Who are you trusting this morning with your soul? Would you bow with me, please? As we quiet our hearts before the Lord. That question, who are you trusting? That is the great question, not only of this life, but ultimately of eternity. Who are you trusting? If you're here today and you are trusting Jesus Christ and Him alone, then like the psalmist, you have a hope that God will receive you because of what Jesus did. If you're here today and you're not trusting in Christ alone, then I would remind you that although the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, the Bible also says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you can know him personally. As the Bible says, by confessing you're a sinner. By believing that Christ died in your place and rose again. And by asking him, confessing him as Lord and Savior, you can know him today. Let's pray. Our God, we are grateful for this, this day. Lord, we are grateful for the, the wonderful testimonies of your grace from these young people in the Alexons. We thank you for that. And Lord, we also realize that the reason they did it and the reason we do what we do at this church is because of the truth that was shared today. Because we have a choice. We can have a hope through Jesus Christ. And we know there's no hope without him. So God, I pray if there's someone here today that has never met you as Lord and Savior, that has never confessed their sin and believed on you and given their life to you, that today might be the day, God, that they'd understand the gospel, and they'd come to know you personally and receive you as their own personal Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you for your word. Help us as individuals, as a community of faith, as the church, to trust you and you alone. In Christ's name, amen. Stand with us if you would, and we will close with these songs.